Hey everyone, this is new. With the help of Yannick from Tabletop Warden, I'm hopefully going to be able to bring you some much snappier videos, some much better content, so that it's uh, a lot less of um, looking at a, a website, which you can already go and see for yourself, and a lot more of trying to bring you some really um, exciting graphics and um, the kind of designs that, um, that the Tabletop Warden put into all of their videos. So... A big thank you to Yannick and all the work he's done um, and all the guild members for helping to uh, collaborate with each other and really push each other forward and produce the best content out there for A Song of Ice and Fire. The best thing about this new video, this big new look Carlo right now, is that I get to show off um, the brand new t-shirt that I got just today from Northern Realms. They have a web store um, which has a lot of designs on, so I'll put a link to that down below. Just today, um, the uh, new Baratheon and Lannister um, and Greyjoy um, designs all went up, which means that there are now six different designs that you can find online, plus some different color variants in them. So there's a ton of things to choose from. So if you want to help support a channel which is uh, providing as much A Song of Ice Fire content as possible, does live battle reports, does Twitch battle reports, does commentary of uh, tournament games and uh, of course is a really big part of the TTS scene at the moment, then uh, go and give uh, them as much support as you can. I'm a member of TTS, but you know, that of uh, NRG, but of course it's not my channel, it's uh, not my store, so I'm just really happy to help them as well by being able to uh, purchase some of this uh, great merchandise. By the time this video goes live, you should be able to head over to the A Song of Ice and Fire Guild, there'll be a link down below, and check out our second collaborative monthly drop. This month's all about Targaryens, and although they've been struggling a little bit um, with the stats and competitively, the whole thing kicked off with a episode of Small Council Radio on Tuesday night. Um, it had Mythico Studio, uh, Chris from Mythico Studios on there as the guest, and they had a really great conversation about the future outlook for Targaryens and how the future meta state could be changing towards their advantages and what really things the Targaryens need to see to become competitive. I found it a really interesting discussion. And I agree with a lot of the sentiments there. They are currently struggling, but all the signs are that there is a very strong core there, which just needs a few more pieces, a few more options, or maybe for the game, just to shift into their favor a little more, sh shift to a slightly lower activation count, and they will have all the tools to jump right up to the top. So that kicked us off. There will be, you'll find on the Song of Ice and Fire Guild page, you'll find a battle report, you'll find commander spotlights, and you'll find the launch of our new vault, which will have 360 pictures of every single Targaryen miniature in the game. A brilliant new resource that's been worked on by Mythico Studios. So um, all really good stuff. So go check that out if you haven't seen it yet. So let's dive on into this week's faction power rankings. There have been no changes in the positioning of the factions, but we've seen the free folk really establish themselves once again back at the top. It's very interesting that we had this period of time, um, which ended about a week ago, two weeks ago, where the Starks were on top and very dominant. This was throughout the NRG tournament, where they were very, very highly represented, and they were very, very well represented at the top of the tournament. The free folk in general have outside of that period of the tournament always been the number one rated faction on the site. That they've now managed to return back there as soon as the tournament is finished. Though there are multiple other tournaments currently running, they are all high quality tournaments. They are all have very high Stark entries. We still have lots of Stark games going on and the Starks maintain a good win rate. But we have seen them lose their dominance as soon as that tournament stopped. There is, of course, the effect um, that in the Assault on River Run tournament, the Starks have not done as well due to the rise and the extreme popularity of the Lannisters. The Lannisters there are currently about to play um, for the final. It's a Lannister mirror matchup rather than a often Stark mirror matchup that we've seen in a lot of other finals. So that's a very interesting development and it can very strongly be connected to the inclusion of Kickstarter models, i.e. the mountain that rides. What's interesting about that is that the Starks also have their own Kickstarter exclusive models, uh, Maeve Mormont and um, Brendan Tully, Outrider Commander, but they are both very um, 
rarely chosen even when allowed and yet the mountain that rides exists in almost every Lannister list in this tournament. He is of course incredibly popular so we will see when the tournament finishes. We're waiting for just one more week and we'll do a full rundown and we'll have a big look at the effect that the mountain, has ri the mountain that rides has had upon the faction um, win rate. But what is very, very apparent is his inclusion, allowing the mountain that rides has massively increased the popularity of the Lannister faction. Now we can see that that popularity hasn't actually resulted in the Lannisters gaining any significant amount of power ranking here. They um, have, however, managed to topple the Starks in winning the event. This is generally people, lots of people say, who play a very high activation Stark, um, Stark kind of list. They say that their natural um, counter, the thing that they're most scared of, is either a Tyrion run Stark list or the mountain that rides himself. So the mountain that rides can show that he could be the future meta counter to the existence of the direwolf spam. But actually, what I think is generally the rule um, is that the free folk, and specifically free folk trappers and free folk with very high radar activation counts, are the natural counter to the Stark activation spam. So let's take a deeper look at the free folk have a look at why they are the number one rated faction. The Free Folk record the highest win rate of all factions on A Song of Ice and Fire Dash stats, with a 62% win rate and a greater than 50% win rate against every other factional matchup. They have always been exceedingly strong. What's interesting and contrasts this quite strongly is that their tournament results post an only a 47% win rate. This is below the average, of course, and possibly represents that when played in a casual manner, the Free Folk are incredibly powerful. But when really put up to the test against other extreme lists from other factions, the 10 activation direwolves, or maybe the top tier tournament um, Lannister base lists, the Free Folk suddenly don't have the um, extra tools required to take these lists on, which are much more efficiently tuned. When we ask ourselves the question, if free folk are winning so often, why do they not win any of the major tournaments? I think the answer to me comes from the fact that although they perform very well in nearly all game modes, the big letdown for them is that they win only 34% of the time in Fire and Blood. Fire and Blood is a very popular and very common game mode. It is well known that it does not favor high activation count and more specifically it does not favor high unit count. Every one of those extra units is a, another possible place to gain uh, victory points from. Having weak units on the board makes it very easy for your opponent to pick units to mark. What's really the killer for the Free Folk is that there are lots of ways around the insignificant keyword in this game mode. So they're really let down by their core mechanic of a large horde playing into uh, Fire and Blood. The issue for everybody else is that their win rate in every other game mode is very, very high. Specifically, their two very strong game modes are Clash of Kings with a 73% win ratio and Dance of Dragons with another 73% win ratio. These are both way, way higher than we would like for in terms of game balance. If you happen to meet a good Free Folk player in one of these game modes, they will probably deny you the win of the uh, tournament. But that Free Folk player themselves, if they have to play into Fire and Blood against any faction other than themselves, they are probably not going to win either. So it's a difficult situation. They have generally not remained that popular in tournament play, neither in um, real tabletop tournaments, nor in terms of the uh, TTS tournaments, where suddenly a model count may no longer be considered a, uh, a factor in its popularity. Getting hold of as many miniatures as generally as needed for a free folk army um, can, of course, be off-putting for uh, some players. 
but it seems that they are just generally one of the most unpopular factions, even though they are performing very, very well. There is a general perception that they have a very difficult play style, at least to begin with. But I would argue that from the submissions that we've collected, casual gameplay, they seem to be the strongest faction. It's actually when they're put under the real test against really good opponents that they start to come apart. What's been really good about the recent resurge of the Free Folk is when they were previously the number one rated faction, they were very reliant upon Harma as the singular, at the time, best rated commander in the game. She was um, by far the highest rated of any commander, and she was very, very significantly um, much higher rated than any other Free Folk commander. But this resurgence of the Free Folk to return to number one has come off the back of a lot of gains in the uh, commander ratings of Steyr and Torment. Harma remains um, a good top 10 commander, but nowhere near the uh, rating that she used to hold uh, when she was um, the number one commander in the game. If she is worse, I don't see why, but it's very positive that the Free Folk now have a much lower spread in the uh, factional uh, commander rankings inside their own faction. This represents that the faction is looking relatively internally balanced right now, that nearly all commanders have a viable option, a viable build. That doesn't mean that all commanders are equal, but that there are ways that each of them can be used that has a good win ratio. This means that there's lots of different variant builds you can make, lots of variety in the game. And um, I'm really interested to see how the Free Folk do in the upcoming Builder Tournament where people will no longer be taking just Harmer and we will see some of the lesser used commanders and hopefully see some new Free Folk builds. That's all for today on the factions. Look out for in the week, we'll be releasing a Commander Spotlight, splitting out the old stats chat into two much smaller videos now. I hope you like the new video style because it's been a lot of work from Yannick and from Mickey. Um, so a big thank you from me to both of them. Uh, let me know in the comments um, what you'd like to see, who you'd like me to spotlight in the future. I think we already have ourselves somebody for this week, but I'm really always open to knowing who you would like to see a deeper analysis on. Um, like I said, don't forget to check out the guild and all the new releases there. The Targaryen, um, the Targaryen monthly drop uh, will be another great release and something you should definitely have a look at. Um, I think the Targaryen players out there need every little bit of help that they can. And there's some really brilliant advice on there. Some really great uh, insights from um, a lot of competitive players, uh, players from the whole spectrum. And you can just see some really, really cool stuff. So until next week, like and subscribe. Thank you.